Queen Elizabeth II's life has been a journey like no other. Throughout her reign, she has been the United Kingdom's symbol of continuity and stability. Her many visits to nations around the world have won her the unwavering respect of her subjects and peers. The warmth and hospitality with which Her Majesty has been received is an indication of how the visit is appreciated. As Queen, Elizabeth has weathered criticism, sorrow and tragedy. 1992 is not a year on which I shall look back with undiluted pleasure. She's also enjoyed great heights of unprecedented popularity. At a very early age, she was called upon to lead the British Empire, and it's to this end she's devoted her life. I declare before you all that my whole life, whether it be long or short, shall be devoted to your service. She has increased the work of the monarchy, and in the tradition of her late father, pursues her duties with dignity and compassion. Like all special friends, we can talk frankly, and we can disagree from time to time. She is the genuine article, a loving wife, mother, and grandmother to her family. The Queen has brought new trends of modernization and openness within the monarchy, and has kept the institution relevant in a rapidly changing world. Long may she reign supreme. Princess Elizabeth Alexandra Mary was born on April the 21st, 1926. She was the first child of the Duke and Duchess of York, subsequently King George VI and Queen Elizabeth. Four years later, she gained a sister, Princess Margaret. It was decided that the princess's life was to be as normal as possible. No longer was the future monarch to be sheltered from her people's concerns by royal excess and opulence. Instead, she was to understand the inescapable reality of a nation still coming to terms with the effects of the First World War. When aged just 11, her grandfather, the king, died, and her uncle Edward succeeded him. Later that year, Edward abdicated, after his proposed marriage to divorce socialite Wallace Simpson provoked a constitutional crisis. Elizabeth's father was now king, and she became second in line to the throne. During World War II, when aged just 18, she first bore the full way to regal office. Whilst the king was on a tour of the Italian battlefields, she performed many of his official duties as head of state. Elizabeth was also determined to do her bit for the war effort and joined the Women's Auxiliary Territorial Service and was trained as a driver and mechanic. After the war, the princess accompanied her parents on a tour of South Africa. And on her 21st birthday, she pledged her devotion to the monarchy. I declare before you all that my whole life, whether it be long or short, shall be devoted to your service and to the service of our great imperial family to which we all belong. But I shall not have strength to carry out this resolution alone unless you join in it with me, as I now invite you to do. I know that your support will be unfailingly given. God help me to make good my vow, and God bless all of you who are willing to share in it. It was then announced that Princess Elizabeth would marry her true love, Prince Philip of Greece. The wedding was initially intended to be a relatively low-key affair in light of the country's great hardship following World War II but royal wedding fever captured the public's imagination. It was the dawn of a new era. The wedding day, November the 20th, 1947, 
became an international celebration, with the world's leaders gathering to witness the historic event. The future queen and her prince declared their love inside Westminster Abbey, in front of 2,000 guests. At the conclusion of the ceremony, the bride and groom made their way outside and were met by the roar of an appreciative crowd. Upon their return to Buckingham Palace, Elizabeth and Philip gave the hysterical crowd what they'd been waiting for. The couple were then presented in front of the cameras. In order to make her wedding dress, Elizabeth had saved up ration cards to purchase the material needed. The beautiful gown was made of ivory duchess satin and decorated with around 10,000 white pearls imported from America. Cascading rose petals tossed by family and friends showered the newlyweds as they embarked on their honeymoon to the bride's childhood home on the Balmoral estate. The overwhelming interest in the royal marriage led to them receiving 2,500 wedding gifts from around the world. It was a truly magical time for the couple. Happiness was enhanced almost exactly one year after exchanging their vows, when Elizabeth and Philip welcomed their first baby, Prince Charles. The nation rejoiced at the news of the birth of the prince. Let us give thanks to Almighty God for the birth of a son to Her Royal Highness, the Princess Elizabeth, and our husband, the Duke of Edinburgh. Two years later, Princess Anne was born, a sister for the prince. The health of King George VI declined during 1951, and again Elizabeth was called upon to stand in for her father at public events. The princess and the Duke of Edinburgh undertook a coast-to-coast -coast tour of Canada. They traveled 10,000 miles over 14 days and were enthusiastically greeted by thousands of Canadians throughout their busy tour. They were then welcomed to the United States by President Truman. Thousands of Americans lined the streets to get a glimpse of the British princess. The couple took a tour of the White House whilst it was undergoing renovations. It gives me great pleasure, on behalf of my father, to present this overmantel to you. It is his hope, and mine, that it will be a welcome ornament to one of your proudest national possessions, and that it will remain here as a mark of our friendship, so long as the White House shall stand. Thank you very much. It has been reported to me that you would like to come back again and bring your lovely children. When you do that, we hope that the restoration of the White House at that time will be finished and that you can see the gift installed in its place in the Blue Room. The tour was considered highly successful. Elizabeth returned to her children and ailing father before setting off on a state visit to Australia and New Zealand. On a stopover in Kenya, the princess was brought the news that her father had passed away. Elizabeth immediately returned home, for now she had ascended to the throne. The first three months of her reign were passed in seclusion, mourning the loss of her father. The queen's first public engagement after her father's funeral was the traditional Easter Maundy money service. Following tradition, the Queen gave silver coins to deserving poor people.
In 1952, she traveled from Buckingham Palace to the Palace of Westminster for her first state opening of Parliament. On the surface, Elizabeth seemed happy and relaxed, but in fact, she was busily trying to keep the lid on a scandal within her own family. Her sister, Princess Margaret, had fallen in love with a divorcee, Group Captain Peter Townsend. The Queen did not approve and used the authority of her position to prevent her little sister from marrying him. Townsend was later banished and exiled abroad to an embassy in Brussels. The coronation finally took place in Westminster Abbey on June 2, 1953, despite the death of Elizabeth's grandmother Queen Mary several months earlier. At Elizabeth's request, the ceremony was broadcast on television and radio around the world. Television was in its relative infancy and brought home the splendor and the deep significance of the event to hundreds of thousands of people in a way never before possible. Prime ministers and leading citizens of Commonwealth countries were present to witness Queen Elizabeth II taking the coronation oath. Or pertaining according to their respective laws and customs. I solemnly promise so to do. The kingdom that Queen Elizabeth II inherited from her father was a confident one. The war had ended and 1953 proved to be a golden year that imbued Britain with a sense of optimism. Most importantly, the nation was brimming with affection and hope for its new young queen. She proved herself to be the perfect model of a modern monarch and bore the immense burden of public expectation both gracefully and willingly. Despite the jubilation for the new queen, the British government believed some countries might drop out of the empire. It was Prime Minister Winston Churchill who stated, we've got this film star of a queen, let's send her out on a global charm offensive. It was a masterstroke. The Coronation World Tour would take her to all corners of the world. The Queen and the Prince flew from London to Bermuda and Jamaica, where they were indeed received like movie stars. They then boarded the SS Gothic and enjoyed the company of a Navy escort. On the way to Fiji, they went aboard the cruiser Sheffield to meet the crew. Upon their arrival in Fiji, an island chief presented the Queen with a whale's tooth. This was the first visit to the colony by a ruling monarch. The Queen and Prince took part in a kava drinking ceremony. Their next port of call was the Pacific island of Tonga. The couple clearly enjoyed the spectacle of a native war dance. After just 18 hours on land, they set sail for New Zealand. The coronation tour's mission was to strengthen attachments to Britain and the crown throughout the empire. These visits presented the queen and duke in a truly imperial fashion. In turn, it gave the Queen the opportunity to consolidate her position as the head of the British Commonwealth. The vast majority of the tour was spent in New Zealand and Australia. She was greeted in Sydney by Prime Minister Sir Robert Menzies. Elizabeth took the opportunity to speak to her people. Standing at last on Australian soil, on this spot that is the birthplace of the nation, I want to tell you all how happy I am to be amongst you and how much I look forward to my journey through Australia. The Queen discovered that the high esteem and affection in which the new monarch was held 
was not confined merely to the United Kingdom. She was able to gauge for herself her extreme popularity throughout the Commonwealth and her many realms. On the return home, they made stops in Uganda and Malta, where Elizabeth and Philip were reunited with Prince Charles and Princess Anne. Finally, they sailed from Malta to London via Gibraltar on the new royal yacht, Britannia. Queen Elizabeth is the most widely traveled head of state in history and became the first reigning monarch to circumnavigate the globe. After being abroad for six months, she could now return to her other role of being a mother. It was a happy day for Elizabeth when she escorted Prince Charles to his first day at school. Having not enjoyed being privately educated as a child, the Queen was keen to give her son the opportunity to meet and socialize with boys his own age. In 1957, duty called once more. She opened the Canadian Parliament, becoming the first monarch of Canada to open a parliamentary session. On behalf of the Commonwealth, she made a state visit to the United States. Elizabeth and Philip sailed into New York's harbor and took in the sights. The glamorous young monarch was welcomed to New York City with a ticker tape parade befitting war heroes. Her next engagement was at the United Nations, where she addressed the General Assembly. After a trip up the Empire State Building, she attended a dinner hosted by the Pilgrim Society of the United States and the English Speaking Union. On the maintenance of understanding between us, the future of the free world depends. May I thank you from the bottom of my heart for what both your societies, the Pilgrims and the English Speaking Union, are doing to fulfill this splendid task. God save the Queen. The early 1960s were a very happy time for the Queen's family. Firstly, with the birth of Prince Andrew in 1960, and then four years later, Prince Edward was born. birth, Prince Andrew was second in line for succession to the throne. However, as time has passed and more babies have been born into the royal family, Andrew is now fourth in line and Edward seventh. The royal family appears to be the ideal model of a British family. But it is said that the Queen's relationship with her children is at times distant. She has always put her role as sovereign above all personal concerns including her children. The 1960s and 70s saw an acceleration of the decolonization of Africa and the Caribbean. Over 20 countries gained independence from Britain and the Queen's empire was diminishing before her eyes. She used the media in an effort to regain the monarchy's former popularity. When President Nixon arrived at Buckingham Palace for lunch with the Queen, she allowed television cameras into the palace for the first time. Using television as a communications tool, she commissioned a documentary about the royal family. The film stressed that although the Queen's family was indeed royal, it was first and foremost simply a family. Just as her coronation had been filmed and had attracted an enormous global audience, Elizabeth was convinced that Charles's investiture should be televised to bring the British people closer to their future king. Sadly, in 1972, the former king who abdicated for love, Edward the Duke of Windsor, died of throat cancer. The royal family attended the funeral where Elizabeth tried to console his grief-stricken widow, Wallace Simpson, the Duchess of Windsor.
an adoring public received the Queen when she celebrated her silver wedding anniversary. The decision to make the royal family more accessible through television had worked. The Times newspaper commented on how much the public perception of the royal family had altered, noting that the Windsors were a close and remarkably devoted family. The Queen's popularity was also prominent abroad when she visited Australia to open the Sydney Opera House. The American public and President Gerald Ford also received her warmly on a state visit during the United States bicentennial celebrations. The British and American people are as close today as two peoples have ever been. But north of the border, the Republican movement in Canada was gaining momentum. In 1977, a national poll revealed that 42% of Canadians believed the Prime Minister was the head of state, whilst 37% correctly named the Queen as the formal executive. Elizabeth marked the silver jubilee of her ascension to the throne in the summer of 1977 amidst the largest and most vibrant street parties seen since the end of the Second World War. A million people crammed into the mall to watch the Queen and Prince Philip as they made their way to St Paul's Cathedral. When I was 21, I pledged my life to the service of our people and I asked for God's help to make good that vow. Although that vow was made in my salad days when I was green in judgment, I do not regret nor attract one word of it. The celebrations reaffirmed the Queen's popularity. Despite recent negative press coverage of Princess Margaret's separation from her husband. The 1980s began with further national rejoicing when the engagement of Prince Charles to Lady Diana Spencer was announced. The world was captivated by the fairy tale romance. But leading up to the wedding, the Queen was shot at during a Trooping the Colour ceremony. The monarch was shaken by the episode but soon recovered her composure and continued with the parade. 17-year-old man was arrested for the shooting. When Diana walked down the aisle of St. Paul's Cathedral, Britain seemed to come to a standstill. It's said that the Queen was immensely proud as she watched her eldest son and her heir marry a beautiful young aristocrat. As long as you both shall live, I will. The wedding greatly boosted the royal family's popularity with the public, but all too soon, it became clear that it was not a happy union. In its later years, the Queen tried to mediate between the two, for the sake of their marriage and the image of the monarchy. The following year, the Queen gained a grandson, Prince William. She's said to be very close to her grandchildren, particularly Prince William of Wales and Zara Phillips. The following year, the Queen found herself in another precarious situation. She awoke in her bedroom at Buckingham Palace to find an intruder in the room with her. Remaining calm, she made two calls to the palace police switchboard. Elizabeth spoke to the man whilst he sat at the foot of her bed until assistance arrived seven minutes later. For months after the ordeal, the Queen remained anxious. To add to her anxieties, like countless other mothers around the world, she watched her son Andrew join the Falklands War as a helicopter pilot. All she could do was hope and pray for her son's safety and go about her business as usual. Mercifully, when the conflict ended, Prince Andrew returned home and was hailed a war hero. In 1982, she hosted US President Ronald Reagan at Windsor Castle and enjoyed a gentle horse ride with the president. But the following year, it's believed she was angered when his administration ordered the invasion of Grenada, one of her Caribbean realms, without notifying her. The Queen travelled to India to award Mother Teresa the Order of Merit. On another occasion, she also presented her with the Nobel Peace Prize. 
Sadly, this was the start of a 15-year period that would test the British monarchy to its very limits. The IRA brought its country's war for independence to Elizabeth's doorstep in the summer of 1982. A car bomb exploded as Blues and Royals troopers made their way to the changing of the guard ceremony. Four men and seven horses were killed. As head of state, the Queen talks regularly with prime ministers and is expected to be politically neutral. The Queen and Mrs Thatcher were the two most powerful women in Britain during the 80s. But that's where the similarities ended. It's widely understood that they didn't get along. Their strained relationship reached boiling point when the Sunday Times published an explosive cover story. The Queen was portrayed as being fundamentally opposed to Mrs Thatcher's policies. The issue of sanctions against South Africa had brought things to a head. The Queen felt extremely protective about her beloved Commonwealth nations, who were lobbying for Britain to stand up to apartheid, whilst Thatcher was more concerned with the economic benefits of trade with South Africa. The marriage of Prince Andrew and Sarah Ferguson looked for a while as though it might absorb some of the negative publicity surrounding the Queen. Within a few short years, however, it became clear that it had had the opposite effect. The breakdown of their marriage gave the public an image of the royal family described as dysfunctional and self-obsessed. Her Majesty, it seemed, was all but forgotten as the nation focused its attention on the ups and downs of the younger generation of royals. The Queen travelled to Australia to celebrate 200 years of permanent European settlement. Her first engagement was to open the new Parliament House building, like her father and grandfather had done on the very same day and hour years before. But Aboriginal protesters became vocal and prevented Her Majesty from hearing the royal anthem. Then the demonstrators turned their backs on the ceremony. 1992 would go down in history as the worst year of the Queen's life. Diana and Charles's decaying relationship was constantly in the news, and Andrew and Sarah announced their marital separation. This was followed by the end of Anne's marriage to Captain Mark Phillips. But the worst was still to come. The publication of Andrew Morton's book, Diana, Her True Story, revealed her eating disorder, suicide attempts, and her husband's infidelity with a married woman, Camilla Parker Bowles. Morton's book shattered the public image of the royal family. We wouldn't have published this story if it wasn't true. During a state visit to Germany, angry demonstrators in Dresden threw eggs at the Queen. Although it must then have seemed impossible that anything else could go wrong for Elizabeth that year, it did. Windsor Castle suffered a severe fire. The Queen and her family were devastated. Shock, horror. Um... A shock and horror in the fact that it took hold so quickly. Um, I mean, I happened to be a around the castle when it, when it started, um, and I heard the fire alarm, and some two or three minutes later, um, when I came out of the room that I was actually in, you could see the smoke, uh, not as extensive as, as uh, it is now, but you could definitely see it. What was your mother's reaction? Uh, her Majesty was shocked. Initially, the public felt great empathy for the Queen, but controversy arose when it was announced that the restoration bill of £16 million would have to be paid by British taxpayers. The outrage emanated from the royal family's tax-exempt status. The Queen acted swiftly to quell the criticism, announcing that she would pay income tax. The year ended with a lawsuit, as the Queen sued the Sun newspaper for breach of copyright when it published the text of her annual Christmas message two days before its broadcast. It's difficult to know just how anyone could have weathered so tempestuous a year with such patience and dignity. Unusually, the Queen summed up the year with a speech of a personal nature. 1992 is not a year on which I shall look back with undiluted pleasure. In the words of one of my more sympathetic correspondents, 
it has turned out to be an Annus Horribilis. Annus Horribilis is a Latin phrase meaning horrible year. <laughs> President Nelson Mandela officially welcomed Elizabeth to South Africa upon her arrival in Cape Town. It was the Queen's first visit since 1947, when, as a princess, she toured the African continent with her parents. The following year, South Africa adopted apartheid, and South Africa withdrew from the Commonwealth in 1961. The abolition of apartheid in 1993, however, and the establishment of a multiracial government paved the way for South Africa's return to the Commonwealth and for a visit by the Queen. She described this visit as one of the most rewarding of her reign. You have rounded off quite splendidly what has been one of the outstanding experiences of my life. I shall never forget the welcome you have given us. We shall take back in a new form an old message. Faith can move mountains. Faith can recreate a nation. The warmth and hospitality with which Her Majesty has been received is an indication of how the visit is appreciated. A parting gift of a prize bull clearly amused the Queen. High fertility, wonderful genetic characteristics. The following year, the Queen returned Mandela's hospitality when he became the first South African president and former prisoner to stay at Buckingham Palace. Nineteen ninety seven was another horrendous and tragic year for Elizabeth. Diana, the Princess of Wales, was killed in a car crash just outside Paris. For the first time during her reign, Elizabeth became unpopular with the public when she and the other members of the royal family did not participate in the public outpouring of grief following the death of Diana. This brought sharp criticism from the normally favorable royalist tabloid press and caused many in the public to view the monarchy as cold and unfeeling. It's believed that Elizabeth held negative feelings towards Diana and thought that she had done immense damage to the monarchy. Eventually, however, the tide of public opinion was too great to resist and the country was given the sight of the entire royal family bowing to Diana's coffin as it passed Buckingham Palace. The Queen also made a rare live television broadcast to address the grief of the public regarding Diana's death. Elizabeth's change of attitude is believed to have resulted from strong advice from the Queen Mother and Prime Minister Tony Blair. The public embraced the Queen again when she and Philip celebrated their golden anniversary. On the eve of the anniversary, her husband of 50 years summed up their relationship in a speech given at a lunch at the Guild Hall. Of course, after 50 years of experience, I find there's a great temptation to give advice. <laughs> <clears throat> the trouble is that no two marriages are quite alike. However, I think that the main lesson that we've learned is that tolerance is the one essential ingredient of any happy marriage. It may not be quite so important when things are going well, but it is absolutely vital when things get difficult. And uh, you can take it from me that the Queen has the quality of tolerance and abundance. <laughs> the following day, the couple attended another lunch hosted by Prime Minister Tony Blair. Most recently, during the sad days after the tragedy of Diana's death, it is you, if I may now speak to all of you directly, who have seen us through and helped us to make our duty fun. We are deeply grateful to you, each and every one. Yesterday, I listened as Prince Philip spoke at the Guild Hall, and I then proposed our host's help. Today, the roles are reversed. All too often, I fear Prince Philip has had to listen to me speaking. Frequently, we have discussed my intended speech beforehand. And as you will imagine, his views have been expressed in a forthright manner. <laughs> he is someone who doesn't take easily to compliments, but he has quite simply been my strength and stay all these years. 
and I and his whole family, and this and many other countries, owe him a debt greater than he would ever claim or we shall ever know. London was lit up with fireworks on Millennium Night, and the Queen joined in the festivities of Millennium Dome. No doubt the Queen, like most of us, was wishing for happier days in the new century. Royal history was made in 2000, when the Queen Mother was the first of her family to turn 100. Just like other centarians, she received an official birthday card from the Queen. A crowd of 40,000 cheered as she approached her daughter's home. Elizabeth escorted her mother onto the balcony, and she was joined by all three generations of her family as she waved the adoring crowd. A truly happy day for the whole family. Just three months later, another birthday to celebrate. The Queen's daughter, Princess Anne, turned 50. In recognition of her charitable work, she was made a lady of the most ancient and most noble order of the thistle, of which her mother was extremely proud. Uh, on this particular occasion, we are celebrating something which is really an accident of birth over which I had no control. <laughs> <laughs> and for which I seriously owe one very important thank you, which is to my mother and father. <laughs> and more than just the accident of birth, because really thanks to their example, their advice and their help that uh, you're all here tonight. The family came together for a service at Windsor to honor Prince Philip's 80th birthday. All were in good spirits, although Princess Margaret was extremely frail from suffering the effects of a recent stroke. Sadly, in 2002, the Queen's sister Margaret passed away at the age of 71 after suffering another stroke. The princess's later life was marred by illness and disability. Her funeral was held on the 50th anniversary of her father's funeral. The Queen Mother then passed away the following month, aged 101. Over the years, I have met many people who have had to cope with family loss, sometimes in the most tragic of circumstances. So I count myself fortunate that my mother was blessed with a long and happy life. She had an infectious zest for living, and this remained with her until the very end. Since the death of her mother and sister, it's believed that the Queen's relationship with her children, while still somewhat distant, has become warmer. Later that year, the Queen celebrated her Golden Jubilee, marking the 50th year of her ascension to the throne. Due to the recent deaths of the Queen Mother and Princess Margaret, many speculated whether the Jubilee would be a success. Determined to press on, Elizabeth went on an extensive tour of her realms. The official celebrations began when she addressed both Houses of Parliament at Westminster. Here she quelled rumours that she may abdicate in favour of Prince Charles. I would like above all to declare my resolve to continue with the support of my family to serve the people of this great nation of ours to the best of my ability through the changing times ahead. Thousands gathered outside Buckingham Palace for what was called the Party at the Palace. This massive concert featured various famous musical performers from across the British Isles. The evening climaxed with a stunning lighting and fireworks display that lit up the palace like never before. A 
following day, a national service of thanksgiving was held at St Paul's Cathedral, to which the Queen and Prince travelled in the centuries-old Gold State coach. This was followed by a procession in the mall outside Buckingham Palace. The evening climaxed with a fly pass by a Concorde and the Red Arrows. Elizabeth has enjoyed good health throughout her life, often being described as robustly healthy. But in 2003, she had keyhole surgery on both knees. Three years later, she returned to hospital to have torn cartilage removed from her left knee. During this operation, she also had several lesions removed from her face. The numerous surgeries led to concerns that the Queen was overworked for a woman of her age and she should slow down. Elizabeth agreed to hand over some of her public duties to her children. But like her mother, she intends to keep working until she is physically unable. The Queen was in good health when she welcomed yet another American president to Buckingham Palace. She read a speech carefully written by the British government at a dinner for George Bush. Unlike in the United States, the British head of state is not limited to two terms of four years. <laughs> like all special friends, we can talk frankly and we can disagree from time to time. Unfortunately, Philip dropped his glass as they were about to toast the president. French President Jacques Chirac greeted the Queen in Paris as the British monarch began a state visit marking the centenary of the Entente Cordiale Agreement that ended the two countries' rivalry. Fittingly, the Queen addressed the gathering in French, for when she was a child, she learned French from a succession of native-speaking governesses. Madame et Monsieur, je vous demande maintenant de porter un toast au président de la République et au peuple français. Vive la différence, mais mais vive l'entente cordiale. Seven years after Diana's death, the Queen opened the Diana Princess of Wales Memorial Fountain in Hyde Park. This was the first occasion since Diana's funeral, the royal family and the Spencers, the princess's family, had been seen in public together. I think the whole anger or rift or whatever has been really overplayed in the media and um, it hasn't been like that for us. So. Today was much more about a celebration and not a great healing of rifts because they didn't exist. The event went smoothly and members of the two families were seen chatting amicably to each other. I cannot forget, and nor can those of us here today who knew her much more personally as sister, wife, mother or daughter-in-law, the Diana who made such an impact on our lives. Of course, there were difficult times, but memories mellow with the passing of the years. The Queen then faced a personal and constitutional challenge. Mummy. <laughs> Prince Charles was now eager to marry Camilla Parker Bowles. The fact they were both divorced brought back the painful memories of the abdication crisis of 1936. At first, the Queen would not allow Camilla's name mentioned in her presence. But ten years later, the Queen welcomed Camilla into her family with at least half-open arms. Elizabeth and Philip did not attend the marriage ceremony. The Queen's reluctance to attend partly arose from her position as Supreme Governor of the Church of England. And of the promises they have made to each other, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Elizabeth and Philip did, however, attend the service of blessing and held a reception for the newlyweds at Windsor Castle. The 
following year, the Queen was clearly happy to attend Prince William's graduation from St Andrews University. It was during this time that William was dating Kate Middleton. The Queen approved of their relationship, but encouraged the couple to date for at least five years before considering marriage. During the morning rush hour of July the 7th, 2005, London was shocked when a series of bomb explosions struck its underground trains and a double-decker bus. 52 people were killed and some 700 were injured, many of whom were treated at the Royal London Hospital. The following day, the Queen visited some of the victims and emergency staff who responded to the terrorist attacks and gave the nation perspective in a time of great confusion. Sadly, we in Britain have been all too familiar with acts of terror, and members of my generation, especially at this end of London, know that we have been here before. But those who perpetrate these brutal acts against innocent people should know that they will not change our way of life. Atrocities such as these simply reinforce our sense of community, our humanity, and our trust in the rule of law. That is the clear message from us all. Without any doubt, she is one of the most popular monarchs in history. Queen Elizabeth II has steadfastly gone about her duties as both princess and queen of the British Empire. I have vivid memories of the coronation of my mother coming to say goodnight to my sister and me while wearing the crown so that she could get used to its weight on her head before the coronation ceremony of thousands of people gathered in the Mall outside Buckingham Palace chanting, we want the queen and uh, keeping me awake at night. Now, there is no doubt that the world in which my mother grew up, and indeed the world in which she first became queen, has changed beyond all recognition. But during all those years, she has shown the most remarkable steadfastness and fortitude, always remaining a figure of reassuring calm and dependability. An example to so many of service, duty, and devotion in a world of sometimes bewildering change and disorientation. Long may Queen Elizabeth II reign supreme.